You're listening to a Mint podcast brought to you by HD Smartcast. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Why Not Mint Money. Today we're going to discuss a new product that has been launched by quite a few fintechs in the last couple of months. Uh, SDIs, Securitized Debt Instruments. They exist in a lot of forms. They are backed by pool of loans, pool of receivables, and now they are backed by bonds. So basically, in a bond, kind of a bond squared. So we chat with Anshul, who is a founder and CIO at Wind Wealth, and do tune in. Welcome to Why Not Mint Money, a personal finance podcast where we help you understand basic money concepts and share strategies for you to build your wealth. So let's get started with your money journey. So hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Why Not Mint Money Men's Personal Finance Podcast. Today we have Anshul with us, who is the co-founder and the chief investment officer of Wind Wealth. It's a wealth tech fintech startup. And we're going to discuss an interesting product that uh, Wind launched a couple of week- weeks back. I think last week. It's a basket of bonds, corporate bonds, through which you could get get exposure to a variety of NBFCs, their loan books, their borrowers, and you could kind of reduce your risk through this diversification. So, Anshul, well, first of all, welcome. And uh, at the start of this podcast, could you explain to our users? in in the simplest of terms like what is wind basket and then we sure. could take it forward thanks akshay thanks for having me on the podcast so uh, one minute background about wind wealth uh, it's basically a fixed income investment uh, platform and bonds have been our flagship product which means uh, investors can can invest in uh, various uh, senior secured bonds giving uh, returns in the range of uh, 9 to 11% you should buy companies uh, in the rating bracket uh, starting from investment grade to as high as uh, double plus now bonds can be of uh, two varieties uh, firstly are privately placed bonds and secondly are publicly issued bonds but 98% of the market in india consists of uh, privately placed bonds uh, these are listed bonds mm-hmm. however the ticket size uh, starts from 1 lakh now uh, privately placed bonds have been the flagship product on the platform but we were getting a lot of feedback from the users that one lakh is uh, uh, too high exposure to take to a single uh, to invest in a single bond to take exposure of one lakh in a single entity is there a, a structure uh, via which mm. users by investing one lakh rupee only can diversify their uh, portfolio across uh, various issues right. uh, mm. because like if uh, Uh, ideally if uh, someone is investing in the uh, bond market the user should take uh, uh, exposure across uh, at least uh, five uh, entities if not more so that diversification is there but in a privately placed bond to take exposure in five entities a investor needs to invest at least 5 lakh because ticket size in a privately placed bond is 1 lakh to solve exactly this problem we came up with a structure called as wind basket it's a sebi regulated product rated product listed on the exchange the units come in the dmat account how it works is by investing in a wind basket by investing 1 lakh rupee you end up taking exposure to a basket of underlying different bonds these bonds are mostly issued by nbfcs geographically sectorally diversified so that diversification is well maintained and uh, let's say there are uh, in our first wind basket there were seven underlying issuers so just by investing 1 lakh you have diversified your investment across seven different nbfcs across seven different issuers uh, and that's the like main problem statement that we were solving like how mm-hmm. to enable diversification at a ticket size of 1 lakh and this is precisely what wind basket uh, solves for right i understood so let's let's talk a bit about the structure and then we could move on so it's it's a, it's structured as an sdi or a ptc So I would request you to explain to our listeners in like the simplest of terms what is an SDI and what are the counterparties involved as in uh, wind is the kind of creator as or in the in financial terms we jargon we say the originator of the product and what how it structured it's a trust so 
you could like explain the simplest of terms how it's structured and what are the built in risk mitigants like uh, for for uh, i remember for ptcs when i did a story there were a lot of mitigants like there was an interest rate spread there were cash collat over collateralization cash collateral but in this structure what are the built in mitigants and uh, are there any over the top mit- risk mitigants that you have you guys have built in so sure. let's let's talk about that sure uh, so the wind basket is a securitized debt instrument uh it's a jargon i know uh but uh, that's how sebi defines it uh sebi in 2008 came out with a set of regulations as to how market participants can structure a securitized debt instrument uh it's somewhat akin to securitization but the underlying are bonds not retail loans right mm-hmm. uh, how the structure works is uh, a special purpose vehicle is created uh, also called as spv the legal entity is a trust the bonds are sold to the spv which is the trust and trust in turn issues units called as sdis to investors so when you are investing in the sdi you are investing in the special purpose vehicle which is holding the bonds in terms of counterparties which are there uh, wind obviously is the structurer and the originator of the transaction which means we are selling the bonds from our balance sheet to spv's balance sheet to the trust and there is a rating agency which uh, does the rating of the entire transaction the sdi units which the investor is investing in are listed on a stock exchange uh, the the first wind basket has been listed on bse bombay stock exchange uh, then there is a sebi registered trustee which is appointed to oversee all the compliances all the regulations all the day to day operations and processes of the underlying mm-hmm. spv which is set up uh right. so trustee also takes care of the repayments uh, which go to the uh, investors who are investing in the sdis then there are a bunch of counterparties like auditors law firms etc uh who do the drafting structuring uh, uh, etc etc uh, right, right. that, and that's how like broadly the transaction is structured uh, your second sure. ha, your second question mm-hmm. is like in terms of risk mitigants uh hmm. here there is no cash collateral over collateral etc which is typically there in a retail ptc Uh, by retail ptc i mean where, wherever the underlying are retail loans like when you invest right. in wind basket the underlying are wholesale ncds that uh, uh, spv is holding in case of retail ptc the underlying uh, trust property are retail loans let's say there is a nbfc for, let's say a mutu for example mutu has given out a bunch of loans uh, gold loans to its end borrowers even those uh, end loans can be securitized and such a transaction is called as a retail SDI. What we have done right. is a wholesale SDI, which means it's not end individual retail loans which are being uh, securitized. Rather, the loans given to NBSs, uh, example, let's say uh, Vivriti, Navi, Mutu, etc. These wholesale loans given to other NBSs are getting securitized. So this is uh, what we have done is a wholesale SDI. Understood. So, for example, like. like in this basket there are seven bonds so what's what's winds or your thought process as to what kind of bonds are to be uh, like to be put in in a specific basket what is the due diligence what is the investment philosophy what are what are the parameters that you look to put s- certain bonds in a basket and like in the future ba- baskets if you want to talk about that so uh, before i come to the basket i'll like uh, tell our overall investment philosophy a uh, venture wealth okay. is a curated platform which means whatever bonds we bring on the platform we do our detailed due diligence we have a in house risk team which uh, analyzes the financials sees the systems mm-hmm. processes operations of the nbfc and only right. those nbfcs that we have done our due diligence on get onboarded on the venture wealth platform in terms of now further cherry picking for a uh, venture basket all the bonds which get selected uh, as part of venture basket come from those nbfcs where we have done our due diligence in terms of uh, filters that we apply we prefer uh, those nbfcs where the leverage is on the lower side because lower the leverage lower is the risk for the investor then we right. we only work with those nbfcs which have uh, uh, external private equity or let's say a public equity it should not be a promoter an entity because when a mm-hmm. third party investor comes on board lot of uh, things change the governance improves better auditors are appointed by the external equity investors and these uh, governance checks are typically not there in a promoter run entity 
so all the entities that we onboard uh, onto the platform uh, must have a third party equity investor then we look at the financial strength nba numbers system processes the underlying sectors in which they operate and only once the nbsc has passed all our filters get onboarded on the platform in terms of further cherry picking uh, for the win basket we try to ensure that uh, the nbscs we are cherry picking are sectorally diversified it means it should not be the case that all the nbscs in the basket come from the same sector because the diversification reduces in the basket secondly we ensure that uh, the nbscs that we are picking are also geographically diversified it should not be all these nbfcs or operating in let's say north india or east india or a particular state etc that sectoral and geographical diversification significantly reduces the risk for the investors because the entire money is not exposed to a single sector or to a single geography so this is the thought process which goes behind cherry picking uh, nbfcs for the wind basket right understood so i i have an uh, interesting data point on the credit default risk uh, cumulated default so i went through a crystal report i think they released it last quarter so it summarizes the uh, the cumulative default rates for uh, securitized instruments and uh, normal corporate issues in the last 10 financial years so the data uh, like if if we are if we are going to buy an sdi or a securitized product we expect we expect ki uh, we expect that the default rates should be a bit tad lower than what would be for a corporate issue but the day the stats were the stats were interesting in the sense for the i think uh, le, uh, for the triple a rating the stats were almost similar like i think for corporate default corporate issuers it was like 0.01 or something like that default the uh, default rates after 3 years of issuance and for sdis it was 0.2 so uh, in my in my understanding there isn't a much much uh, difference in the default risk uh, like what what we guys say if if we securitize an instrument so any views on that yeah i mean see the data you are looking is for retail sdis it's not a app comparison for a wholesale sdi which right, which right, is what right. we are discussing right. discussing because in our right, is right. the underlying are corporate bonds these are not retail loans but if you were to like let's say talk about retail sdis i kind of agree with you uh the risk is somewhat similar to wholesale exposures maybe even higher than case of a retail pool sdi when compared to a, a let's say bond investment issued by the same issuer a classic example right. is like during the 20s uh, during the demonetization we saw a lot of retail sdis which were from microfinance sector which ended up defaulting mm-hmm. however the originators of those sdis survived the demonetization because they were able to this uh, incremental equity they were able to survive but in case of a retail mm. sdi once the pool is sold then there is no incremental equity incremental credit enhancement which can be provided as per regulation so investors right. in retail sdis specifically during uh, extreme events like uh, uh, demonetization covid did see losses while the bond investors did not face uh, uh, much loss uh, uh, during these extreme events but what we are discussing for wind basket these are not retail sdis these are wholesale mm-hmm. sdis where the risk is very similar to let's say investing in a bond uh, fundamentally but the risk gets uh, lowered because of the diversification which is there understood okay so let's let's talk about uh, like according to your view points what are the risks that still exist in the product so when i came across your product specifically i think one of the risks that that i i saw was the concentration of the top two issuers is is kind of more than the bottom five so maybe kind of a concentration risk that that if 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 in case anything goes wrong for that particular thing the the weighting of that entity that nbfc in your basket could uh, potentially impact returns for the whole basket like do you guys view it as a risk or there was like a careful decision behind that keeping that in bfc at the highest weighting yeah i mean uh see uh, the risk will be uh, relative uh, to let's say directly investing in bonds are these risk free products definitely not i mean fd is a risk free product 
any debt instrument which is offering return higher than FDs will carry some amount of risk. Right. Uh, risk is like part of any financial product. But what we believe is uh, risk should be mitigated by careful structuring. Uh, that's why we only do senior secured bonds because senior secured bonds uh, have some kind of collateral. Uh, in case if the NBSC were to go bankrupt, there is some amount of collateral uh, which is again cherry picked so that recovery can happen by selling the underlying collateral as part of the bankruptcy proceedings. That's how risks get uh, uh, reduced and mitigated uh, in terms of bonds that you bring on the platform. Then obviously we do our due diligence, uh, filtering, cherry picking, uh, etc., which further reduces the risk. Uh, That's how risks are mitigated in bond uh, as a product. Now, if we talk about wind basket relative to bond, we say Mm -hmm. the risks are further reduced compared to directly investing in bond, purely because of diversification. Mm -hmm. Because if you're investing one lakh rupee in a single bond, you have 100% concentration risk. Entire money is exposed to a single issuer. But if you invest in a wind basket, you correctly mentioned the top issuer has 23% concentration. But compared to directly investing in one, where the uh, concentration was 100%, it has come down to 23%. So risk uh, has reduced. Can it be further reduced by having more issuers? Yes, which is our endeavor. Mm -hmm. Like in future, we want to have wind baskets where there are 15 underlines. Why why just take only seven? Why not like make it even more diversified so that the risk is further reduced? And that's a process which will like uh, take some time. But yes, that's the uh, end uh, uh, kind of goal for us that uh, have wind baskets where no single issuer has more than ten percent concentration. Understood. Okay, so so also uh, I think the uh, secondary market for these products is quite illiquid. Maybe if someone wants to sell this uh, sell the the wind basket uh, the sgi uh, in the secondary market i don't think there are a lot of buyers in this i think and how like if 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 you were to solve it or some fin- other fintech were to solve this this problem like we all know that debt markets in india are quite illiquid like what what should be the path anyone should follow if you want to like if you have any ideas about that yes uh, you're correct like even though bonds and wind basket these are listed on uh, uh, BSC, uh, listed on exchange. The secondary liquidity for these products is limited. Uh, having said that, what we do is like uh, on Went Wealth platform, there are now more than uh, uh, 4 lakh signed up users. In case if any investor wants to exit any of the bond or any of the basket, they, they reach out to us uh, via WhatsApp, uh, email, etc. We in turn reach out to other investors on the platform and try to do that matchmaking. And we don't charge any fee for doing this matchmaking. Typically, like uh, uh, we are able to find willing buyers uh, amongst the investor base that we have uh, on the platform. And the uh, initial investor who wants to exit is able to exit. Uh, exit. But there is no guarantee as such that these willing buyers mm. will be available at all points of time. So we tell our investors right. that please don't park your emergency funds there. Emergency funds should be parked in, uh, let's say, FD. This is not the right product mm. for parking emergency funds. Uh, invest only that much money, which you are comfortable holding till maturity in the worst case scenario. In normal times, yes, mm. you will be able to exit. But tomorrow, if a COVID-like scenario happens, where the liquidity completely dries up and there is no willing buyer, then there is a remote possibility. You may have to wait uh, for the entire 15 months to get your money back, which is the tenor of the bond basket. So I'll say there is a decent liquidity, but it's not a guaranteed liquidity which is there. Understood. Understood. So a lot of people, uh, and there's been there's been talk in the market, are viewing this product as an alternative to, let's say, debt mutual funds. So could you like do a top-down analysis of? Obviously, the diversification in a debt mutual fund would be quite different than what we have here. There are the duration, maturity, and uh, the specifics but like like let's do a top down like tax efficiency that that's the main point a lot of people are talking about and uh, uh, the diversification is still there but like according to your analysis your views if you could uh, tell our listeners so i think there are two aspects to, to this one one is like let's let's uh, try to understand the conceptual difference between a wind basket uh, and a debt mutual fund and next i'll come to how the commercially the risk return is different between the two products. At a conceptual level, when you are investing in a debt mutual fund, you are outsourcing the investment decision process to a fund manager, which means you're giving money to a fund manager 
but here is my 1 lakh rupee as per your broad investment philosophy feel free to deploy in uh, ncds that you feel uh, i should be investing in the fund should be investing in which means the underlying bonds in a debt mutual fund will be cherry picked by fund manager as per his or her own discretion and the uh, bonds will be dynamic like let's say initially the fund manager uh, invested in uh, 20 bonds then the fund manager may exit two of those bonds or purchase three other bonds so the underlying mm-hmm. portfolio is at the discretion of that uh, mutual fund manager and is a dynamic portfolio mm-hmm. in case of wind basket you know a friend that okay these are the seven ncds which are there in the wind basket then the basket is static there won't be any trading in the bonds there won't be any addition deletion on the, uh, in the basket that's a decision which has been taken on day 0 uh, that these are the seven ncds which are there in the underlying basket and you are taking the decision there is no fund manager etc which is there like when will bring different baskets with different uh, uh, underlying ncds you can take a decision okay i need to invest in this basket or that basket or some other basket so that's a conceptual difference which is there that wind basket uh, portfolio is static known to you upfront while in a debt mutual fund the decision making process is outsourced to a fund manager and the portfolio will be dynamic right uh, coming to the mm-hmm. uh, risk return profile of uh, the two products uh, you are correct a debt mutual fund is much more diversified compared to a wind basket maybe in a, if in future we have wind basket with a 25 or 50 underlying bonds then the diversification will be similar uh, having said that the returns in wind basket is much higher compared to a debt mutual fund uh, debt mutual funds typically are open ended typically invest only in triple a securities that's why most of the debt mutual funds uh, the ytms that uh, they are projecting uh, are in the range of 7.5 to 8.5% uh, there will be expense ratio which will be paid to the uh, uh, fund manager so post uh, expense the returns investors can expect will be in the range of 725 to 825 uh, but the risk is lower because it's much more diversified uh, issuer wise and sectorally as well in wind basket the risk is slightly higher uh, compared to debt mutual fund but the returns are also higher uh, most of the baskets that we are bringing on the platform are giving returns in the range of 10.5% to 11%. Next part is the taxation. Uh, the net taxation is same, uh, which is as per your income tax slab. However, a key difference is a debt mutual fund doesn't have any TDS, while a wind basket has a TDS component. It's a slightly nuanced point, but important to understand. The net mm-hmm. tax that you will pay is same for both the products. But a right. TDS of 25% is deducted in a wind basket while making the interest payouts. In debt mutual fund, there is no TDS. You need to uh, do the income tax filing and uh, pay uh, whatever tax slab you fall in uh, if you're in 30% tax bracket. Net taxation in debt mutual fund will be 30%. In wind basket, it will be 30%. But 25% will be deducted while making the TDS and 5% balance uh, our tax you will need to pay. Uh, so this is uh, a key difference from a taxation point of view. Mm-hmm. understood so uh, i was talking about the taxation difference on let's say if i if i were to sell it after one year the ltcg difference like what a what a normal bond gets but but i think a lot of people won't be selling the sdi in the in the like till it matures yes you so correct there will be ha huh, most of our investors they tend to hold till maturity there is limited uh, secondary trading which happens in these bonds mm-hmm. and anyways the tenor of these sdis are on the lower side the first right, basket right. had a tenor of only 15 months uh, trading happens like when the tenors are like pretty long let's say 5 years 7 years people want to exit right right but these are like short term investments and secondary trading is like very limited so most of the investors mm-hmm. tend to hold till maturity understood so i i i have a last question a very last question uh uh so your this basket's rating is triple b which is investment grade and the returns on this basket obviously they since it's diversified to a to a very large extent the returns will obviously come down but for it similar triple b rated bond i think the market is currently around 13 14% if if i if i correctly remember and the basket offers 
4.3 as the i think the ytmi or 10.5 so why is like a, like a 4 percentage uh, point reduction in returns i know diversification is one point but isn't it's a, isn't it a, is a off putter for an investor uh, like like how do you guys see it? uh so two points here typically uh triple b well rated papers are trading in the range of 12% in the institutional market the papers in triple b category which are trading in the range of 14% these will be mostly entities where market is expecting a rating downgrade or is operating in uh riskier segments so there is some amount of uh, risk right. which market is pricing in but uh, similar tenor well run nbfcs in triple b category are borrowing in the range of 12% plus minus uh, 50 basis point uh now coming to the second point that uh, the rating of <laughs> this basket is triple b uh so it's a interesting uh, question so how the rating models in india work is uh, let's say uh there is a win basket uh have its seven underlying uh, entities rating agencies assign the rating which is lowest uh, uh, rating of the papers in the underlying basket which means tomorrow if i have a win basket where the Mm. let's say 99% mm. government of india security which is triple a rated and i add 1% of uh, another paper in triple b category ideally one will assume the rating of the basket should be weighted average of, of uh, ratings of the underlying basket 99% right, okay. of triple a and 1% of triple b but that basket right. also will get triple b rating that's how the rating models in india work the basket will get a rating which is lowest mm. rating of the underlying papers in the basket even in this basket for example bulk of the composition is from the a rating category but just because we have one paper uh, or sorry two papers in triple b category the concentration of those papers is 20% only 80% is still in a category but because right. of rating models the basket has got a triple uh, b rating and that's how the rating models in india are designed and so so, so shouldn't like you as in players that are doing it uh, like kind of make it like public or like talk about this because this is an interesting point the investor like for me who is a bit educated would say it's a triple b rating and i'm getting a, a yield of 10% why would i invest in that like like it's an interesting point i didn't know a lot i think 99% people would not be no retail investors especially so i think maybe you guys could more talk about this more and create awareness yeah, about this yeah no valid suggestion in fact like a in general we tell our uh, investors that okay look at the rating but look at uh, uh, the product beyond the rating as well another right, interesting right. example is let's say uh, there is a nbfc in a rating category the same nbfc issues a senior secured bond issue and the same nbfc issues a subordinate bond we know subordinate bond is much much more riskier compared to a senior secured bond because subordinate bond doesn't have any collateral and if the entity mm. were to go bankrupt first right belongs to the senior investor subordinate investors may not get any money from the uh, bankruptcy proceedings from the recovery the rating agencies give the same rating to both the uh, kind of bonds even though the market will price in a subordinate bond uh, at a pricing 2% above the pricing that the senior secured bond of the same nbs is getting but uh, in the rating models both the bonds get the same rating even a senior secured bond issued by the nbs will get a a rating and a subordinate bond uh, issued by the same nbfc will also get a a rating and a lot of uh, like uh, uh, french players in the market use these to fool the retail investors they mm. market a subordinate bond saying okay it's a rating category available at 12% mm. but if you look at the yeah. finer details mostly that bond will be a subordinate bond which is far far riskier compared to a senior secured bond so investors also like also need to go beyond the rating I try to look at the structure in somewhat of more detail uh, to understand okay what is the actual risk uh, uh, in the product understood understood so that is all from my side like anything uh, at the end that you would uh, like to advise or like to like kind of uh, preach to the investors who are like kind of interested in your product and like alternate fixes fixed income products as like a whole uh nothing but basket like as a concept is uh, uh, a good product for investors to venture into the bond space because if you invest in a privately placed bond if you invest one like uh, the entire money is exposed to a single issuer 
rather than like taking that back to enter into a new product uh, wind basket can be a good uh, route to invest in that market because the diversification will, will be there if you are investing one lakh it will be spread across multiple issuers so mm-hmm. even in a hypothetical scenario if one of the seven issuers were to default your only 14% of the money is kind of stuck all back the remaining money is still protected and will be repaid by the other performing six entities so that is risk in a diversified product gets uh, uh, reduced substantially and is a good way to uh, take exposure to a new product understood understood so thank you so much anshul and uh, thanks to win 12th as well uh, for joining in and uh, thank you to our listeners and we will meet you in the next episode so thank, thank you. you thank you thanks for tuning in to another episode of why not mint money if you have further questions you could reach out to me on twitter other or x other at rodgy underscore akshat you could also reach out to me on linkedin further you could reach out to win 12th anshul and uh, grip and nikhil on their respective linkedin and twitter handles thank you so much Stay updated on this podcast. Follow us at HD Smartcast on all the major social media platforms. To listen to more such podcasts, log on to www.hdsmartcast.com. Hold up. 